Terry Crews. Uh, pre- I've never done anything like that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, Terry, is, uh, am I pronouncing your, your surname correctly? Is it Craig's? Am I right? Cargus. Cargus. Okay. So, welcome to the Rod Shop um, or Joe's Rod Shop podcast in South Africa. And you are from Peterson's Motor Museum. Am I correct? That's absolutely correct. Yep, here in Los Angeles on Wilshire Boulevard. And how are things in Los Angeles at the moment? Because the, the, the reports that we're getting is that things are going a bit wild on that side. Well, quiet would be one way to put it. In, oh, in some cases, the fact that, that businesses are shut down um, makes it very tough uh, on on every business, not, not just us, certainly, but... Um, you know, I, I would say that the upstairs part of the museum and the, the, the front end of the museum is quiet because we don't have admissions, but we're, we're working frantically and, and doing a really a marvelous job on uh, creating a digital museum uh, on the other side. Excellent. I mean, that's, that's what, we, what we're here to talk about today. Now, just so, obviously, I mean, from South Africa, um, I'm, I'm a complete gearhead so I, I i know all about peterson's motor museum and it's it's on my bucket list is one of the places I, I have to go visit because i've i've seen so many things of the amazing cars that you guys have and what you guys have done over the years but for the guys that know um can you give us a, a quick overview of what a peterson's motor museum is it, it, interesting uh, the 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 museum was opened in 1994 by uh, Robert E. Peterson. And uh, Bob Peterson was a publishing magnet. In fact, uh, founded a Hot Rod magazine uh, back in the 40s, and that grew into Car Craft and Motor Trend. And, and I think ultimately, he might have had as many as 80 different publications mm. as a publishing empire, but it was uh, including guns and, and uh, fishing and teen magazine and all kinds of things, but the beginning of his, of his uh, uh, empire was automotive. And so in 94, they opened a museum and uh, not a lot changed over the, over the first 20 years. Uh, and after the, uh, and Mr. Peterson passed, I think in a, about 97. Um, and and uh, so the legacy was, the museum is here. It was, it was rolling along. Again, not much was changed in, in the year 2012. Bruce Meyer, who was the first chairman of the museum for the first 10 years, said, we've got to do something. Something's got to change. Um, I got recruited to come in as the director, uh, in, and that was in August. And, it, and a great story goes with that. I, uh, I started on Monday, uh, uh, worked here Tuesday. Wednesday, we drove up the coast. Uh, highway 101 along the Pacific Coast Highway or the, or the, the ocean and, and up to Pebble Beach for Monterey, uh, oh, wow. the car week. And on Sunday, I was sitting in our uh, 1952 Ferrari Barchetta that was owned by Henry Ford getting an award uh, up on the platform. And I thought, boy, this is a good first week. <laughs> this could be fun. But uh, in uh, in October of 2012, David Sidoric, another of our uh, chairman, met with an architect and challenged the architect to come up with a design that would change this building. The building itself had been opened by a Japanese department store, and then and they only operated for a couple of years, and then Orbox bought it, and they, they operated for about eight years, but the building had sat empty. But the exterior was... Uh, Actually, it, it was an ugly building. Um, so David Sidoric challenged this architect to come up with something that represented speed and motion, which he did. Within a, a few short weeks, came back with a presentation pro bono that would have cost you $250,000 if you had to buy it. And ironically, almost to the line is what we ended up with as, a, as the exterior, this series of, of uh, red and silver mm. ribbons made of aluminum. It's, um, it's beautiful. I'll, I'll actually post a photo of it so, so people can actually see what, you, what you're talking about. The exterior of the building is absolutely beautiful. 
it's a, it, it's a, it's a stunning example of, of real creativity. Mm. The, the, so we, we decided we were going to do that. And then we had to decide what, how we had only thought about the exterior. Oh my gosh, if we're going to do that, we need to fix the interior. How are you going to do that? Anyway, we ended up closing the museum for 14 months and announced that we would open December 5th of, of, uh, of 2015 and people told us you can't do that. You could never take a project that large and just gut it, start over again, and make it. You know, we're going to do this for this many dollars and open on this date. You're insane. You can't do it. We did it at 14 months in on time and on budget. Um, since then, we've been described as the world's best automotive museum, um, and that is what is more a function, not just because it's a great looking building but because we have 11 galleries in the interior and we change each gallery out in a rotation every year. Uh, oh, so wow. that no matter when you come in, there's a brand new something to see. Uh, yeah. And it goes from hot rods and low riders to Bugattis and, and, and Chevys and, and uh, you know, the, the electric cars. Um, it, it, hot, right now, there's a Hollywood exhibit on uh, called Hollywood Dream Machines. It's the most elaborate and, and extensive uh, collection of movie cars ever ever mounted. Oh, wow. It's really, really, really cool. From the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, what's it, Back to the Future car up through the first Star Wars car, uh, the Mad Max cars up from Australia, uh, it, everything that you can imagine. I, I take it Batman, all the Batman cars, all the George Barris um, two, cars. Two of, the, two of the cars. Yeah, there's 50, 50 some odd uh, movie cars. Oh, it, wow. it's a It's a great exhibit. Um, anyway, and, and the, our, our, our curatorial team does a wonderful job. They're, they're all car people. And, and the, the, you know, we have a, a, a culture here that is you can't wait to get here in the morning and then you don't want to leave at night. So it's a it's a very fun atmosphere and a lot of fun to very creative uh, to place to be. That must be very scary working with these. I can't, I mean, I, I remember seeing the photos when you guys had um, the Ed Roth collection out uh, uh -huh. some of Ed Roth cars. I mean, I, 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 I love, I've got Ed Roth tattooed on my body, like in three different places. <laughs> I love Ed Roth. Um, and, just I'll tell you. I'll tell you story about the Ed Roth and that whole series. Von Dutch, of art. yeah. Um, I got a call one day from a fellow who manages um, uh, Mr. Hetfield, the head of the lead guitarist in Metallica, mm -hmm. and said that James was thinking about, you know, splitting up his collection of ten really beautiful customs, and that he was thinking of sending us one. And I said, what? why send us one and why break up the collection? Mm -hmm. You know, if you'll give us all of them, we'll mount a, a, an exhibit. At, and, and when we're done here at the museum after a year or more, then we'll put them uh, on tour with other museums around the country. So they said, well, James would like to come and see you guys and meet you guys. And we were, oh, we were, wow. uh, we toured the whole museum, top to bottom, all four floors. And the last gallery that we went into the hammer gallery, we had the Roth cars, we had, you know, uh, Von Dutch art, we had, you know, the, the, you name it, the Moon Eyes stuff and, and all the rest of it. And, and it was, he's looking at it and then he had just come out of a Bugatti exhibit, you know, and then into this. And then, and he's, he's looking at, and he said, this is really cool. You guys are celebrating all of the forms. And then we walked around the corner uh, in that, in that exhibit and there was a picture of four guys and they were tattoo artists. And he said, those are my guys. Those are the guys that did all my tats. He said, this oh, is wow. great. I'm home. We're here. The, the, the cars are coming here. That was a, a really fun moment, a, re a fun story. Yeah, I, I saw when you guys posted, he's got, a, he had an extensive collection. I mean, he's had some beautiful cars built over the years. Oh, 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 he spent a fortune and spent a lot of time with some real talent. Rick Dord did a wonderful job designing some of those cars with him of course, uh, but they're really, really works of art. Well, uh, him and, um, as it, Billy Gibbons, uh, ZZ Top, I mean, he's also got a beautiful collection of um, cars. I mean, he, he, he's got the original, the Cadzilla, uh, uh, Boyd, Boyd Connington. It's upstairs. Cadzilla is upstairs. It's here. You, get, you guys have Cadzilla. No. And 
along with the Hirahata Merc. Oh. So yeah, you know your stuff. <laughs> oh man. You know what my favorite parts of Cadzilla is the is the uh the license plate. Mm. It it says I ate Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's what that's that's why I'd like I say I, I mean I'm I'm not joking. Coming to you guys is, is an absolute dream. I mean, you guys are showcasing the, the the full history of customization, where it started, how how it's progressed it, over the years. Um, we we've been blessed that, that to be in the heart of, of car mm. culture, and you know we're we're if Hot Rod Magazine started here, and then we're the we're the the parent you know group of that, and and mm. um, you know what's another cool thing that happened uh, over the last several years is that. Mr. Peterson, when he sold the company, all of the archives went with the company. Oh, wow. And he tried for years after he had sold it to get the archives back, and he could never do it during his lifetime. We managed to uh, work with Motor Trend, and through a really gracious offer from them, and then support from SEMA, the uh, Aftermarket Association. Mm, I know. I know. Uh, Wade Kawasaki and them, I had him on the show already, yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. We had, uh, so it actually was Wade who signed the deal as the chairman of SEMA for a million dollar grant from them to, so that we could digitize the, the, uh, the archive of 10 million photos what? that, that starts from the forties up through the seventies of car culture here in Los Angeles. Um, and so we're, we're the, uh, the library uh, essentially of, of all of that archive now. Really well, proud of that. Well, from from my side, besides for having the podcast, um, thirteen years ago, I started this. I oh, own yarn. I own SA Hot Rod Magazine, um, which is the only hot rodding magazine in Africa. Um, I'll be darned. Yeah. So, and and that was all from inspiration from reading Hot Rod Magazine in South Africa when I was a kid. Um. So yeah, I, I own SA Hot Rod Magazine. So when I come visit, I'll well, bring you and, some. <laughs> oh no, you have to, you have to. But I, there's an, the, the other thing that we're blessed with it is that Bruce Meyer, who is was the founding chairman and is really our our cheerleader, mm -hmm. uh, world ambassador, if you will, uh, is a hot rod maniac and and has the Doan Spencer uh, hot rod. Do you, yeah. if you know about that car? Yes. I mean, Doan was the, the genius like uh in in metal like uh phil remington was um with gurney and and mm. shelby all those years and um those two those two guys that were all hot rodders and the early hot rodders um are really the guys who made southern california the yes. the, the, the race capital um well they, uh, they were the ones all forms right. of racing started for look from from what I understand from the history, everything started with California, um, and it was drag racing, it. NASCAR, um, Bonneville, Bonneville, uh, everything. I mean, and and California was uh, basically everything that was cool came from California: surfing, skateboarding, uh, yeah, <laughs> hot rod. I mean, well. The and I, 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 we moved from Joliet, Illinois, which is just south of Chicago, in 1955, to uh, Newport Beach on the on the water here in the coast, and just south of LA. And during the 60s, 50s and 60s, there were probably at least eight or nine drag strips, professionally run drag strip strips that ran every weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and if you weren't there, you were in the streets somewhere or out in the orange groves drag racing you know your buddies yeah. we, had a, we had a place in corona del mar that we could see that was on you were on the top of a hill so you could see several miles around so when the cops were coming you, you could you could leave but people would come down from la uh to race all of the the beach kids in their cars it was a very summers at uh, on friday and saturday nights in southern california were all about drag racing it was it would Bob's Big Boy. Have you ever heard of those stories yes. of yes. people well, waiting an hour and a half? I have something. Actually, in this edition, I, I just want to get to it quickly. Um, a few years ago, we, we did a some research on when hot riding started in South Africa. 
and um, we actually found the first rodders in 1955. That's uh -huh. them. There's 1930. I, I will actually, I'll say what I will do once we're done, I will send you an email with these articles. And there is the hot rods in South Africa yeah. from 1955. That's when great. hot rodding started. Yes. The first uh, 32 roadsters, coops, everything started. I'll, I'll, send the, I'll send the article to you. I think you'll love it. Um, it's a, I think it's part of a three part uh, that we did on the original guys that started hot rodding in South Africa. So last year, last year, Bruce Meyer put a, a, a lunch together for Ed Iskandarian, uh, Alex Exadius, who was SoCal oh, wow. Speed Shop, and um, who was at uh, one, one of the others. Anyway, and they started talking, Ed Pink from Ed Pink Engines. They started talking about the days when they were kids and in the early 50s and getting together and they would go down and, and sit at, the, at a shop and talk about engines and how do you make them go fast and where do you go? And this guy, this crazy guy named Bob Peterson, you know, they had tiny shops, had, a, had an idea for this book and they used to sell parts over the counter and they'd sell a few parts and they'd sell a few parts. Suddenly the world changed because yes. Peterson would take pictures of their products, write copy for them, and then put them in the magazine. And he said, now, now we're selling parts to guys in Ohio and New Jersey, and, and our, our business quadrupled and, and flourished overnight uh, because of Peterson. So, but that was a, the, the growth of hot rodding, you know, was really, really promoted at best yeah. by, uh, by Peterson. He was also the founder of SEMA. Yes, yes. Uh, we, um... Amazing guy. The, in, in the 1970s, there was a, a, a guy that um, he, he got a hold. I actually met him. His name was Alan Safi. And he, he made in South Africa and he found a Model T. A guy had an original Model T in South Africa and he made a, a fiberglass mold of it. And he started producing fiberglass Model Ts. And. Hmm. Alan Safi told me the story. He got his hands in South Africa on a set of um, a, a magazine, a hot rod magazine. And I, I don't know if it was the Coochie, the, the Coochie 30, uh, the Coochie Model T that, that came out, but he said he saw this Model T, this hot rod with these big wheels and a, you know, a 350 Chevy motor with a supercharger. And he thought it was the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. And he went and casted um, because he, he, had, he could find the motor and he could find everything. But the only problem is we had no mag wheels in South Africa. Uh, so uh. He, he had the frame. So he went and him and his friend casted a set of wheels in sand, aluminum wheels in sand, that, yeah. um, and put them on this Model T and then drove... Well, 600 kilometers, it was so, because they, they, they tested it and it worked so well, they drove 600 kilometers, probably like 400 miles or 300 yeah. miles. And this Model T, open window, open everything. Huh. And that was actually the start of the custom wheel industry in South Africa. That shop that he had became a company called Smith Wheels, which is now all our main manufacturer. And that all came from wow. the <laughs> that's great that's a great story and you know that the, there are so many of those that because there were craftsmen yeah that could do things and and um you know the racing here started on the, the dry lakes mm -hmm. uh and the after when the guys came home from world war ii that they, they a lot of them had been trained as mechanics had never done that before and they were they had access to parts a little bit of money and they were buying essentially jalopies because that, that's what they could afford and they'd hop them up and personalize them. And, and, uh, but the idea then was how fast could you go ultimately? So that was all the dry lakes. Then the dry lakes started to you'd start running out of space. And uh, in 19, it was, I think 1954 was the first official drag race here in Southern California oh, wow. at the Orange County Airport with the Santa Ana Airport or the, now the, the John Wayne Airport. Mm -hmm. um, and that then began the NHRA, which actually 
Bob Peterson helped fund uh, the Wally Parks used to work for Peterson. Uh, oh, Peterson wow. gave him some money to help start the National Hot Rod Association. And, you know, they, now it's not a quarter mile. It's about, what, a thousand, thousand feet mm. of, uh, that in 330 miles an hour in the top fuel cars. But, uh, yeah, that, that was all here. Okay, I mean, can, I wonder how to, to see the progression. I mean, I, the, I, I did a podcast actually this, this morning with a, a local drags, uh, drag racer in South Africa. And we were talking about top fuelers are hitting what over 10,000 horsepower, you know, three, 10 to 12, yeah, yeah to three seconds. Um, the, the speeds, I mean, from to see it from the day when it started to the progression of where it is now, it must be amazing watching and knowing that you built that, yeah, you, you, you were part of it, you helped start that. You know, there, there are so many great memories that uh, uh, a fellow racer here in Southern California, Jim Busby, uh, who really became a successful road racer. Um, I met Jim. He was he lived in Pasadena, and we were in Newport, and he had a summer house in in Newport with white shag carpeting, and we were going to a party at his house, and and he had a a, a, a dragster engine uh, taken apart on the carpet <laughs> the carpet was now black <laughs> but he, he, this is i mean this is what i mean this is just part of the fun and and uh, mm. but he you know these are are you watch things like that when irvine um dragway opened a, a friend of mine in the old days they used to push the cars to start them from uh somewhere down the track but mm. back towards the lights Toward the starting grid, yeah. you'd push them down, get them started, then they turn them around and get them staged. Um, for the opening night of the uh, of the party or, or of the track, they had a big cocktail party and they were all around the Christmas trees there. And and this was that they they light them off. He's in a top fuel dragster and the throttle sticks, and he, he's now a fully lit dragster coming towards the cocktail party. <laughs> I figured cocktails are the rail, so I took the rail and crashed the car. Anyway, it, it was okay, but things where they they uh, at that same raceway uh, when they were testing, or people thought slippy clutches back in the day were the way to get off the line. You know, you don't don't engage. You know, and just spin the wheels. Have a clutch that would slip a little bit and help you mm. help you get off. That there we saw it was dusk, and and I, and it and it blew the clutch. And this this orange disc took off from the car, the the, the flywheel <laughs> off into the parking lot like a skyrocket. Wow, that you were seeing, yeah. But it, these days, if if you ever have the opportunity to go down by the Christmas tree when these cars are going off, mm. it, it's something that it, you can't believe. Your chest cavity is pounding. Yeah, it's a, there's a station. I took three of my grandsons to their first ever drag race and put them down by going where they go through the traps. So it, it, their, their first cars they ever saw in a meet was 330 miles an hour. Oh. <laughs> and it's a sound you can't, you can't imagine at a speed and things happen so fast. And these kids, are, they, the cars went by and they looked at me and said, geez. <laughs> <laughs> but that's brilliant okay. because that, that moment – Nothing will put they, they, it's going to be hard to reach that moment again in your life, you know. That that's your first, that's like your first car's a Ferrari, you know. <laughs> yeah, so every everything yeah, yeah. else from a motoring perspective is going to struggle to get to that 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 point, which is brilliant because it just means that the sky's the limit after that, yeah. True, true. And 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 there's a those things happen in your life that that are those moments that you, as you mentioned, that that you treasure and that, that, that you can recall them because hmm. it's nothing like it, you know? And, uh, you know, so as a grandpa, I, of course, that was a great one for me I, to, to take these little guys and expose them, you know, to, to not, not, not only the sound, but if you're walking through the paddock and they're warming the cars up and you got the nitro in the air, oh, you yeah. can't breathe you're watering and you're thinking, why am I here? It, because you, so you can do that. <laughs> we, um, great. My my daughter is uh, she's three years old, 
and I mean, I, I, I'm involved with a lot of different types of racing. And I, I've got a video, um, I think it's about two, it was a, a year old. We were at a drifting event, but mm -hmm. it, it was a, a, a TV shoot. And I had it in the car um, next to the track. And I've got a video where you can see us sleeping inside the car. And through the window, you could actually, there, I think it was a few meters and it was a... Uh, uh, the, the fence and then the tires and then the cars were coming past. So I've got this video where she's sleeping and you see the cars keep sliding past in the back of the window, <laughs> faster as she's going. Um, and then a few weeks after that, we, we did a, uh, a run and I've got her sleeping in the back of a, a 65 Fastback, uh, a Fastback Mustang while we're doing a run. And... Um, I, I said to my wife, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's you to her all, uh, every time we got to an event and people see she's sleeping, they're like, Oh no, we don't want to start cars or anything. I'm like, Oh please, she'll sleep through anything now. Yeah. No <laughs> idea what motoring stuff she's done. She, she even yes. has little pink bangs for, for motor, for motoring events. If it gets too loud. So yeah. That, that's her, her baby tunes, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, she's three years old. I think she can identify more hot rods, muscle cars than most people in their thirties. <laughs> oh, that's fun. That's yeah. fun. So, so, but now the, the, the big thing that we want to talk about is this virtual, um, is it, is it a virtual motor show that you guys are starting this, this week or what, what's we this just, virtual system? Just finished, we just finished last week. Um, Monterey Car Week, Pebble Beach yes. Car Week, is the largest single um, uh, grouping of activities anywhere on the planet. It mm. is the, the most significant uh, uh, showcase of cars uh, really anywhere. And it goes on, now it's all week. Yeah. Uh, there, it used to be, Pebble Beach was a concours on Sunday, the Pebble Concours, and then... Uh, because Laguna Seca is, is located there uh, nearby. They, they started racing vintage cars there years ago and mm -hmm. called Monterey Historics. And then uh, other shows started to uh, be added during the week because the, the, the whole world descends on this place. Yeah. So what are they going to do during the week? Um, and so the quail uh, show is on Friday uh, virtually all of the major auction houses have auctions oh, wow. during the week. Um, there's a show at the Monterey Jet Center uh, on Wednesday night, which kind of kind of the official kickoff to the to the week. Um, but then there's a, a show at the Carmel Mission on the Plaza uh, during the day on Wednesday. Um, now there's a vintage racing the weekend before. Those are called the prehistorics. Oh, wow. um, you know, it, it's one of those week-long extravaganzas of, of more cars than, you know, it's sensory overload. Mm. I mean, it, in fact, I think it's could be Thursday on um, Thursday. If you want extra points in the Concours, you, you go on a 50 mile tour so that all of the cars that are, that are going to be entered on Sunday go on this tour down the coast then oh, come wow. back and then park on main street in Carmel so that you get to, to get up close and personal on these mm. cars. Um, and it's something that's so special. It, it only happens there. Yeah. Uh, so with the COVID issue and the, the lockdown, we decided there's an opportunity. We're kind of like Switzerland of, of the automotive world. Yes. Why don't we do something where we give everybody a chance that was going to participate up there who has a budget and a plan and things to do that, and no place to take them. Why don't we organize Car Week and do it digitally? And we did. We had over 40 partners uh, to work oh, with wow. us. Most, we had seven car reveals, new car reveals from new manufacturers. Um, at one point, we did our own concours on Sunday. We had one, at one point 47,000 people watching. And over the week, we had over 5 million views. Uh, what? So... Yeah, it, it was phenomenal. It, it, and the idea was that the partners in it would also promote it as, you know, mm. so that a rising tide, you know, raises all boats. 
but we had, uh, oh my gosh, I, I bet we had 40 different garage tours. We had individuals with these fabulous collections video their collection. Um, oh, and wow. we posted those up during the week too. So there was terrific content, new cars, uh, uh, auctions, the, the regular shows, the Jet Center, the Quail, um, the, the Porsche, the works show. I mean, oh. on and on is, and on. Big can, anyone, uh, can anyone still see any content that was there? Is it still uh, available online or is there, was there recordings made of it or anything? No, why not? that's a really good question. I haven't even asked the question <laughs> myself. I, I've got to believe that we've, we're going to leave it up. Uh, yeah. But it, if it's available at all, it would be Peterson – and it's Peterson, Peter, S-E-N, not S-O-N, yeah. uh, dot org. Uh, it would be up there. And I'll, I'll, put, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the yeah. question. Uh, I'll, check the, I'll check the link and stuff from my side as well. And I'll, I'll put it out for everyone. Um, someone I, I, I spoke to yesterday that I think you would be interested in. Um, I spoke to Rob Ida. Um, uh, yeah. And he had a... Number 40, 43 Tucker sitting in really? the shop. 43, huh. uh, completely original. It's a, 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 I think I'm post, uh, the post, posting the video in, in the next day or two. It's a blue color. The car's been repainted once. Original interior. Like the, he, mm -hmm. he said it's probably the best hood uh, original hood lining of any Tucker that's, still, that's out there. Um, and uh, just what a what an amazing car that was! Oh yeah, I, 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 you guys also had the Tucker feature at one stage, if I'm not mistaken. We we do have a Tucker. We have one of Mr. Tucker's uh, personal cars. Oh. Uh, I, I think he had several, of course. Yeah, but uh, we we have one of one of them. And yeah. they're 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 the great study in 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 advanced technology and you know thinking ahead. Mm. What can I do that's different, which is what drives industry. Um, yes. He was very innovative. And, you know, there's a lot of stories about the other manufacturers trying to drive him out of the industry. He, you know, there's, it's, is that, are, is that part of the movie or did, did he not have enough money? Was it, was it so unusual from, you know, the mainstream auto, automobiles that he wasn't selling them? That I, I'm sure that there is a variety of reasons why the car didn't succeed. Mm. Um, you know, I think it, unlike the Edsel, which was just ugly, um, you know, that, that it, there were too many things that to, for him to worry about, uh, especially finances. Yeah. But we, we were I mean, talking made, about... It, Sorry. Go ahead. No, continue. Continue, please. No, I think the movie uh, with Jeff Bridges, they made it look like the other companies forced him out. Mm. Um, you know, well, it's, it's like a better movie, story. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ford versus Ferrari. Hey, we, an awful yeah. lot of, of yeah. fantasy in that, that uh, but it was also a, a very good movie, uh, a very entertaining movie. That was oh, Ford that versus Ferrari is beautiful. A I, better actually, movie. Now I, I spoke to a, a friend in the UK um, the other day or a few weeks ago, and he he's friend with the Lamborghini family, and apparently uh -huh. they are busy making a movie on the Lamborghini family and the, the fight between Lamborghini and Ferrari. So I, I said, I hope they keep the same actor who played Enzo Ferrari, because I mean, they can make a series of everybody in the lifetime that, that had arguments with Enzo Ferrari and ended up building cars as, and stuff against it. As an example, when one of the things that was a, a, a fantasy in that is that Enzo didn't go to the races. That he he would never he would not have been at Le Mans, uh, <laughs> but I think one of my favorite pieces of the movie was when Shelby supposedly stole the, the stopwatches. I love that. And he asked it, "You want to you want a stopwatch? They're Italian." <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, but something else I, I wanted to say say to you: uh, uh, another car we were talking about um, that was way ahead of its time was the Cord. Funny enough. The cord, absolutely, yeah. yeah front, front wheel drive. Was, uh, the the engineers, Eel Cord was was uh, uh, saluted by Time Magazine as in the first time ever and never since uh, mm. as the man of the decade for the twenties and the man of the decade of the thirties. And he was a financial genius and and a, and a 
you could say in some ways a robber baron, but he was so smart. He would put his name on a company, get the company turned around and then, and then bail out. Mm. Um, but, but in fact, it's, it's said that Franklin Roosevelt set up the securities and exchange commission to, to get him um, <laughs> to the point where he actually moved from the U S to the UK. Yeah. Uh, but even while he was there, he watched, he was watching what was going on in Europe in the thirties and bought the American shipbuilding yard in, in uh, New Jersey. So that when world war two finally came about, he was capable of building warships. So, yeah. I mean, the guy was a manufacturing genius, but the, the, uh, uh, the brothers came to him and said, uh, we need, we're going to go out of business. We need you to buy our company. So I did. And then the, um, who was it? His other, the other company, um, uh, Ed did the same thing. We're going to go out of business. It was Gordon Burick, who was the chief engineer and designer of the, um, of the Duesenberg and uh, who came to him and he said, we have a number of innovations that we would like to put into a new car, mm. but we would like this one to be titled the Cord." So he agreed and that, that, that came about now i i went i went to a guy's um house the one day and he had two special cords sitting there one he had a left-hand drive convertible Mm -hmm. and he had a left-hand drive limousine i i don't know how i don't know how rare they are but there were actual cords. He he had a collection. I think he had. Uh, I, I, as I know, a friend of mine uh, has a cord actually close to me, um, which he, I mean he couldn't find parts, so he ended up putting a three hundred and fifty Chevy motor into it. But the body and stuff's there. Uh, and I know we've got two driving, fully functional driving cords in South Africa. But this guy still it's, has them sitting in a collection. It's a convert. It was a convertible, and it was a, lim- a limousine, extended cord, which I've never seen before in my life. Both in I've and never. I, I was a partner with Billy Cord, and and actually uh, worked with his father, Chris Cord, who was a very successful racer mm. here in America, road racer. Uh, in fact, that was where I met Don Spencer. Was that Don was uh, was building uh, Chris's cars at the time? But wonderful family, real car people, uh, nice as the day is long. You couldn't find a nicer group of folks. Um, but uh, yeah, El was a, was a successful businessman. Ironically, the car business it said was the smallest business he was ever involved in. He, mm. When the U.S. government was giving um, contracts to uh, to uh, people that had airplanes at the time uh, for the post to deliver the the mail uh, from city to city, he bought the Jenny Airplane uh, Manufacturing Works and the Lycoming Engine Works. Mm. and was manufacturing airplanes then he decided also to have an, his own airplane route so he started a little thing called american airlines um <laughs> <laughs> hey, smart guy very smart guy but, do but, you- but cars are, are magnificent that mm. uh, the l29 was the, the first car with the front wheel drive yes and the part of feature i believe i the um, pop up lights turn the, the lights would move with it mm. But a really elegant car, really beautiful, well done. I I need to go actually see if I can get hold of the family and find out if those cars still exist. Um, like I said, I, I remember the limo because I I could not be, I couldn't believe my eyes. The guy also had a bunch of I I was there because he had a bunch of thirties, uh, thirty coupes and roadsters standing there. I mean that's I, I love hot rods. I love cars from the thirties, and then all of a sudden there's this cord sitting. Um, we we we're actually amazed with what cars ended up somehow in in south africa um <laughs> yeah yeah uh, the the auburn court duesenberg museum in auburn indiana could tell you all about those cars i'm uh, sure but we, we've got a guy here close to me who apparently has it's one of the few collection he has every model austin healy really sitting in one room i'll be darned um in- he also has a, a, a Bentley, as, as either Bentley or Rolls Royce, that was owned by the Pope. One of the Popes. Oh. Yeah. No kidding. And you're, you're, we, you're, we have a 
Have you got, but your thought pro, this is what I, I always said why I love cars is the story that a car like that can tell how uh, I mean you, you walk into a little factory in a small town in South Africa and you find one of the most famous cars you know one of the most famous people in the world car is sitting there and your brain just goes how did it get here <laughs> what's the process it's one of our themes uh, that it, cars connect people, mm. and and we have a uh, the downstairs level of the museum is a city block. What? 250 cars, and we give guided tours through it. It's a, it's the most famous part of the of the museum, and and that's the whole the whole connection to all of this is the stories. You can look at a car and say, oh, that's a nice car. Yeah. If you get the story that goes with the car. It's fascinating. I mean, the, the Pope Mobile that we have was actually done by Mexico, GM Mexico. It's a Cadillac. They turned it into an ultra stretch. Um, it was to be used by the Pope as his, at his appearance at Azteca Stadium in, in Mexico City. Mm-hmm. A month before the, the, the visit, there was an assassination attempt on his life, so they wouldn't let him use it. Oh, wow. He blessed the car anyway, and, and we ended up owning it. But um, you know, just, just like that, right next to it, we did so good and evil. Right next to it is the is the Cadillac, is the, uh, the Mercedes Benz uh, stretch limo that uh, Saddam Hussein that was Saddam's car. So you've got oh, the black and wow. white. <laughs> but how do you guys get? I mean, is, is this collector? Is are these car? Uh, let me rephrase that question. The majority of the cars you guys are, is it collectors that give you a car to use for a time period? Um, uh, or has Peterson, the, the museum, actually purchased a lot of these cars over the years? They've purchased them over the years. There are, there are a few cars that we have that are, that are here on loan mm-hmm. that, that help us tell a story. In fact, almost all of the cars that are upstairs on three floors are loaned because they're here to tell a specific a story. story. Yeah. The, the Hollywood dream machines, the electric cars, um, the, uh, the hot, hot rods, uh, the Hetfield collection is ours. It's in the, the Bruce Meyer gallery, Chip oh, wow. Ganassi's uh, collection of, of uh, NASCAR cars, Indy cars, and, and the sports cars, the one that won Le Mans uh, is in our, our motorsports gallery. Um, Porsche has several cars upstairs as a part of an art center design, college of design. Uh, studio Volkswagen has an exhibit to how to how to build an electric car um, it's it, it's I mean we have a motorcycle uh, Italian design uh, exhibit up now with motorcycles 30 bikes mm-hmm. um, it, it goes on and on we, we, we've got a few cars we need to get to to you guys during the 1960s and 70s um, obviously South Africa had apartheid um and we created a few of our own cars individual oh. unique cars uh one uh was the BMW 333 um oh. yes which was based on like the M3 which was only available in South oh. Africa um but my favorite was called the Chevy Canam uh oh. yeah it was a little uh tiny car uh, with a 350 Chevy motor box, huge wing on the back, uh, developed by ba- a guy named Basil Green. They only wow. made 99 of them. And it's I, yeah, yeah, they, and the, there's still a few of them running around. Um, but it's, it's initially, and the funniest thing of this is um, a, a friend of mine actually worked at the, or a friend of mine's dad worked at the factory where they were making these cannons. They were extremely fast, didn't stop for anything. Uh, very bad breaks. Um, and a, a friend of mine, actually, when he, in, he, he spoke to Basil Green, the guy who was behind the car, he said, he, he sat with him and he went, Basil, you know, the, these cars don't really stop. And he's like, yeah, well, they were made to go. <laughs> they went. But um, so a friend of mine's dad worked at the factory. And he said, if you always, obviously there's numbers on the bodies to, for the 99 cars that, that was manufactured. Um, I'll send you a photo of it. 
um, he says, but if you always want to know if you have the right one, he says, when you get underneath the car, you have to look at the, the gearbox tunnel. He says, if it looks like someone went to the tunnel with a five pound hammer, then you know you've got the real one. Because <laughs> it, it was the old forensic bodies that the two door forensic bodies that they were using. Um, and they didn't have time to increase the tunnel to fit the bigger motor and gearbox in. So they would just bang. <laughs> space. And that's Get how they were hammer. Big, big hammer, solve the problem. And that's how they were sold, actually, in South Africa. I'll send you some photos. Wow. We, we've got some very interesting stuff. But, that's, but it, it, those are the stories that go behind, you know, what yeah. automotive history is all about, how things got done and why they exactly. got done. And, and um, you know, people being innovative. And, and sometimes, even if it was a little bit crude, it worked. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we have an African saying, um, uh, South African saying, it's all right, this. We just, it's it's going to be okay. It's gonna, it will work. Yeah, just <laughs> By the way, I, I, I think a lot. There's a, we have a good friend here, Lance Stander. Do you know Lance? Have you heard of Lance? Lance Stander. Yeah. Lance is, is, is African. He is the uh, importer of, of uh, the Superformance uh, must, uh, Cobra. Oh, yes. I know Super uh, Jimmy Price and, and those guys. Yes. I, I know Superformance very well. Uh, sells cars. He can't believe how successful he is. And mm. a wonderful guy. One of the best promoters I've ever met and, and uh, has built an empire up here. Mm. Um, I met him when he first got here and he was in a tiny little warehouse. Now he's got this gigantic showroom and you know uh but he's well known and is at every major show and a, a kind of a real fixture now mm. wonderful guy we actually um it's it's funny um they they actually had a, a lawsuit with carol shelby yes they did the yes um now I, I know that the guy that started the whole thing jimmy price um they started building ac cobras uh, yep. Carol Shelby sued them and then ended up the, I think Jimmy Price has stopped producing. And then a while later, Carol Shelby actually approached him to start manufacturing AC Cobras for them. He, under the they, they have a license on the yeah. super performance Cobras and yeah. the, the uh, Shelby Cobras. Mm. And yeah. at one point, Shelby also gave them the license to build the, the Shelby Cobras and then gave another guy simultaneously the yeah. same license. To build cobras. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the part of Shelby that didn't get into the story. <laughs> and we, we actually did a great story on, on Carol Shelby a while back. And I, I mean, I got to talk to a lot of guys and I got a lot of history. I mean, what a, he was a phenomenal person. Uh, another company that actually sits in South Africa is Backdraft Cobra. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, Absolutely. Now, that's a company. We, we actually, I've, I've got a video clip. Um, we were actually there. I was there last year. Phenomenal. Um, the chassis that they, they have this, this one lady that the chassis are welded up by one lady. She does a, she does a chassis a day. Uh, they call her mom, mama chassis, a uh, big, Af big African lady, phenomenal welder. I've never seen anyone weld so fast in my life. Um, wow. <laughs> Um, brilliant yes. uh, how that was developed here. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that, that's come from, from this side. Now, something I, I wanted to, to say, I take it you guys probably get approached a lot with people phoning you going, so I've got this sitting in a shed. Yeah, so I, I'm sitting with no, like like Carol Shelby, uh, what I call the the bullet, the uh, not Carol Shelby, the bullet car, sure. and end, ended up what was owned by a teacher after all these uh -huh. years. Um, that, that I mean that was phenomenal. I mean, but someone would phone you and go, so uh, the, my grandma has been driving a '67 Mustang her whole life, and apparently it's the bullet car. You'll go, oh whatever, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we actually, we, we, we have a real process because we get, you're right. We get those calls mm. all the time and, and, or you've got a Mustang that has been in the bed shed for 30 years, 40 years, and it really probably ought to stay there because mm. it gets, 
it, there was, you know, there's no provenance, there's no story behind it, but yeah. this guy's convinced that that's a million dollar car. Um, but it's a, you know, the, 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 the joyful part about car and car ownership like that is uh, there's a phrase that says beauty's in the eyes of the beholder. We, mm. We've switched that a little bit and say beauty's in the eyes of the beer holder. We, <laughs> we have a, you know, there's a, <laughs> it's, it's a, there, you can love a car. I mean, I've got guys that are, are absolute crazy about Austin Healy Sprites, mm. you know, little tin box um, people that love their MGTCs. Yeah. You know, you want to talk a little tin box, um, but, but it doesn't matter what the car is. If that's what you love and that's your connection, that's the fun that you're having, you know, mm. to get out in the, on the road and, and, and go drive your, your car like that is, is freeing. There's a, there's a, a special, special time for you to be alone with your car or have your mm. mate and just cruise down the road. It's, that's one of those, my wife and I are on, on coast highway along the ocean all the time. So COVID, you know, this is to go, there's no, nobody open. Mm. So we're, we're up and down, you know, the, the coast along Malibu and up way North uh, along the ocean all the time. It's a very, what's better during the summer than to be along the ocean with the windows down and cruising in a, in a fun car. Well, Next year, obviously, next year, things look much better to, to do anything. Um, I think what we should, now, the, the area where I live, we, um, is a section of South Africa. We, I think we, we've got the most car collectors, classic cars, um, uh -huh. in, this, in this area. It's massive, a huge amount of big car collectors where I am. And we, there's a motor show here called the Nice the Motor Show, which is, it's like our Pebble Beach. I want to put it that way. It's uh -huh. only, it's by invite only. It's only the best, uh, the best cars in, in Africa actually come through to it. I'll get the uh -huh. dates and I think that we need to send an invitation through to, to you guys um, to come it's and see what fun. we've got. Um, yeah. No, it's fun. I, I think you guys will be shocked to, uh, like I say, shocked to see what cars are sitting in Africa. <laughs> and, and like I said, the, the stories on how, uh, how they got there, you know, <laughs> in the first place. <laughs> that's the, that's the, like you said, that's the fun part is that the stories mm. that connect and how did that get here? Yeah. Or how in the, did you, who, who, I don't, I've never heard of a, of a Ford limo, let alone a, 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 a left hand or a right hand drive mm. Ford limo, you know, or right hand, and I'd be fascinated, and all of that is interesting. Mm. You know, get Lance on your show. That I mean, you guys, he is he's he is one of the real characters. I think you have a good time. I'll I'll, I'll make contact with with Superformance because I actually want to get Jimmy Price on, um, who who started the the high tech the high tech automotive and stuff that started building the whole thing. And and, and Con Media works with 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 Lance, so they can oh, hook you up right away. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll speak. I'll speak to. I. I, I think um, Dan. Dan's supposed to be on the show in the next few weeks again. At anyway, okay. We we, we want to have a discussion on now what what's happening after after SEMA is not. What's for, first time in fifty years? Is it fifty years that there's no yeah, SEMA? Yeah. Oh That's yeah. A heartbreaking. Hey, it's, it's, it's oh actually. It, Dan's a real car guy. Yeah. In fact, I when I got here eight years ago, the very first thing that I did was to fire the agency that we had at the time and hire Dan. Mm. And it's been still one of the best things that we've ever done. Wonderful guy, knowledgeable, works with all of the best. Uh, the Ring Brothers, they, they're, they're an account of his. Oh, all I, the heroes around the world. I, I love, I, I actually, I had them on the podcast already because I, I they, there's a Ring, Ring Brother car on my cover. Um, okay. Or, <laughs> So um, the, they actually, I, I was very sad. They, they wanted me to uh, be at SEMA this year to unveil their latest creation. So of course yeah. I'm, I'm devastated because now I can't, one, I can't leave my country and get, can't get yeah. anywhere and, and I, I won't be able to do that. Um, but I, I'm trying to see what we can do with them. I also met up uh, guys I've had on the show, um, uh, Big Red. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, I've dealt with Big Red and, and those guys a lot. Um, I, I mean, like I, I grew up. I, I've I always say to people, I've been riding since I was two. 
Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, I grew up with the, the Boyd car. I mean, we, we, we got little snippets of what happened, what was going on in the U.S. I mean, Boyd Connington was everything. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, he passed away uh, two months before I launched my first <laughs> magazine. Um, really? Yeah, and, and I actually got hold of, of his family and we, we actually did a tribute. My first magazine, I had a tribute to, to, to Boyd Connington. I spoke to his wife and, and we put everything together. Um, and I mean, that, that was a huge honor just to start the magazine and be part uh, dealing with a, some of his, uh, someone like the Connington family. Because um, I mean, you had, he, uh, John? Sorry, say that again? Have you had Chip Chip Foose on? I, Chip and I, I've been trying to get hold of him for forever. forever. I, I've dealt with uh, Chris Jacobs uh, a few times uh, from Overalling, uh -huh. but somehow I, I, I'm struggling to get hold of Chip. Um, I'd love to get him on the Dan, show and, and talk to him. Dan can probably make the connection that his manager is Carson Lev, and mm. um, who used to be the head of adult toys at, at uh, Hot Wheel. Yeah. So another promoter and a, and a smart guy. Um, good story, though. I mean, obviously, the stuff that he's done is iconic. We have yeah. several of Chip's cars here, too. Mm. I mean, what a great... We're story. talking to doing a Chip Foose exhibit right now oh, in, wow. in front of our College of Design uh, studio. Mm. And then uh, when I was talking to Rob Ida, he has... One of the first, it's a 32 Roadster. It's one of the first cars that Gene Winfield worked on. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sitting in his shop wow. at the moment. He, uh, the, it was a, uh, uh, Gene actually closed the cow, one of the front cows for him. And then later on, uh, apparently the guy never paid him for the job. That, that I thought was funny because that's happened to me. He never happened before either. <laughs> <laughs> and then the car got sold a few times and then Gene actually worked on it. But it was apparently one of the first cars that Gene ever worked on. I mean, that would be interesting. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's amazed me over the years how, like the Ed Roth cars and stuff started appearing in the weirdest yep. places and the people didn't know what they had. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that to me was more heartbreaking than anything else. You know, I, you know that that's happening now though, too. I mean, it, and I think it will continue to happen as, as cars evolve and, and, and eras pass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, now Von Dutch is considered a, a, a racist, you know, bad guy. Uh, and and it's a, you know, we were criticized. We, somebody came at us really? for even having any of the Von Dutch stuff in the in the gallery. We said, look, uh, oh yeah, because there, there was a report that he was a Nazi supporter or something like that. If I'm not yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, and and you know that let's he he was a different kind of a guy. He, he was a different. difficult person. What I what I understand from the books that I read, but very very. But you you got to say it is funny and amusing when you walk through a shopping mall and there's a little, there's a girl walking around with a Von Dutch t-shirt yeah, and right. she has no right. idea what she's actually wearing. Right. You know? Right. It's like I mean, Che, che Guevara shirt. It's like, exactly. It was a it was I mean, I, I actually have the flying eye tattooed from one shoulder to the next on my back. My back is a, an <laughs> enormous flying eye. I've got um, rat fink on my shoulder here. I've got another flying eye here. I mean, I love Von Dutch. I love rat fink because it was such an iconic time in history. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything. Oh, yeah. Um, and I love the fact, especially with, with Ed Roth, it, it, he was so anti-establishment, but he, he, he yeah. didn't do it to be negative. He did it for, for the kids that weren't like everyone else. I mean, that, that to yeah. me was always beautiful of it. Um, we, we did a juxtapose exhibit, which was a, a feat. That's, what, that's when uh, Hetfield was in, mm. and, and it was called Juxtapose. It was a, an exhibit that was a takeoff on something that all of those guys got together all of those artists got together and no one would show their work. Nobody anywhere would show their work. So they had an idea, said, aha, I'll tell you what. They went to the Laguna Beach Art Museum 
and said, we, have a, we want to make a proposal. We're going to do an automotive art show. Here's a, here's a whole idea. And this is way back in the, in the 60s, I think. And, and it turned out to be the, still the most successful exhibit they've ever done. And it was wow. Roth and all of those guys, but it was called the Juxtapose. But, but it, it, that, was, that was what launched them. And the magazine, Juxtapose magazine, mm -hmm. was featuring all those artists. And, and uh, like I say, no one would even pay attention to them. But that launched it. That, that said, oh, my God, look at this. This is very special, very unusual, unique. And, and uh, there we are today. No, absolutely. They're icons. They're complete, complete icons. I mean, the, the, rotting, the, the hot rod and street rod industry would not be what it is if it wasn't for them. Yeah. Um, and Peterson loved them. Yeah. Peterson obviously. loved them. But, I mean, it, it was amazing. I mean, with this, because uh, Hot Rod, I, if I understand correctly, it, it's one of the oldest publications in the world. I think it was uh, the oldest autom the first... automotive, oldest automotive, uh, I think, publication in the world. The, it, the first one was a, actually, this is another great story. Mm -hmm. uh, Peterson was, at, right after the war, was at a, a, a film uh, uh, movie uh, PR guy. Mm -hmm. And because all the returning guys were coming home, they were getting their jobs back. He was let go. But he got hired by a, a, a guy named Madman uh, Munts. Madman Munts was the first guy to actually go on TV selling big appliances, screaming and yelling. You know, one of the, one of the crazies. <laughs> and and uh, Munts had an idea. In fact, he built some cars. I think he built 16 cars. We have one of them. Um, but he wanted to uh, create a car show. So he hired Bob Peterson to go publicize it. Well, Peterson had an idea and he went to all of these, these car people, the parts guys, the Iskey and, and, and uh, uh, L. Brock and all of those guys. Mm -hmm. None of them knew how to advertise. None of them knew anything about how to promote their business. So he'd take the pictures, he'd write the copy. What he did was put this book together to promote the show. And that was, a, and, and Gigi Carlton, his longtime 45-year-old, 45-year assistant, still has that book. That was oh, wow. The, and once he finished that and had the show, he said, I got an idea here mm. as an enterprising guy. And that was the origin. And I think it was 47. Oh, that's insane. And, and so a whole, a whole industry was born. <laughs> yeah, and Exactly. And a lot of people got jobs. A lot of car people had mm. great jobs for a long, long time. Exactly. Well, I mean, just and if you here the, we are, with the, the museum, most the, the, considered the best museum in the world after Peterson because of, uh, of Hot Rod Magazine. Mm. Definitely, definitely. So, well, listen, I, I'm not going to keep you too much. I, I see we, we've been we've been talking nonstop for an hour, and unfortunately, in South Africa, we have a thing called load shedding at the moment so my power is going to go out in about 15 or 20 minutes and then we're going to have darkness for two hours um while our, our government tries to sort out our pie, a power crisis in south africa um but so it was an absolute honor to, to speak to you it, it was my so pleasure great. um this is so informative i i, I can pro uh, I, maybe i shouldn't come visit you because i'll probably never leave <laughs> I, I want to put a plug in for a guy that just took over as uh, uh, president CEO of Ford Motor Company, a yeah. car guy, a pure car guy, Jim Farley. Uh, I'm so pleased to see that him get the top job just two weeks ago. Um, he's a racer. He's a hot rodder, a wonderful nice. guy. And I, and we, we have real high hopes that he'll, he'll put that company together the way it ought to be. But uh, so is he hitting all of those? Sorry, is he heading up Ford Motor Company now? He's the, he's the president and CEO worldwide of Ford Motor Company. <gasps> so you're saying we, yeah. we have a hot rodder who now heads up Ford. It can only go up from there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Things can only get better. 32s for everybody, okay? It's... <laughs> so thank like you so much. <laughs> So thank you so much for being on the show and talking to us and I'll put the links and stuff out for everything, but this was absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, I, I've learned so Our, much. Come on, come on up. I, I, I got a guy. I got a guy who can get you in here. Right. Yeah, you know a guy that knows a guy, so we'll make we'll be fine. So. Okay. <laughs> so, Terry, thank you so much, and I, I'll send you some photos and I'll send some stuff from our side as well. And um, yeah, let's let's see what we can do going on. I, I I think I need to put something in the magazine more about Petersons at any rate, the whole museum. Um, maybe Wonderful. we should maybe we should work for for next year. See if we can't put some tours together. Get a bunch of South Africans all, all together so they can all come visit you guys at the same time. I think it's a great come idea. Come down and, and go to Lance's factory. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So thank you so much. Right, you yeah. have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank Bye.